Hello, friends. Thank you very much for joining us here today. I have a special guest here, Pastor Martin Weber, who is joining us to talk about the topic of Seventh-day Adventists and abortion. Now, I've been speaking the last few days. I've lost my voice. I hope that's okay. Um, but let me introduce our guest. Pastor Martin Weber was the former editor of Outlook magazine, director of communication for the Mid-America Union Conference. For the past eight years, he has retired after 41 years of full-time denominational ministry. He worked for the Voice of Prophecy. He was the assistant to the director speaker for It Is Written. He served as associate editor for Ministry Magazine and as a member of the General Conference Ministerial Association. He was also a member of the President's Council and the General Conference Executive Committee. He also served as an adjunct professor at multiple Adventist colleges, a member of the International Police Chaplains Association, and has authored numerous books and articles. Pastor Martin Weber, thank you so much for joining us today. It's such a pleasure. I, I'm honored. Okay. Thank you. Question number one, the first thing I want to ask is, how did you first learn about abortion in your life? Or when was your first encounter with abortion in general? When I was a pastor in Orange County, California, uh, the call came from Dennis Prager, who is a um, well-known Jewish um, commentator on religious and political matters. Yes. He wanted the Seventh-day Adventist to appear on his program uh, to uh, uh, discuss all kinds of matters, one of which was abortion. And I was caught, I was still in my 20s, I was caught kind of flat-footed, I had never examined that. But uh, having been caught flat-footed, it caused me to do some research and come to uh, some convictions on that. What, what year was this, approximately? Oh, uh, this was around 1980. Ni 1980. So the first time that you had to deal with abortion in general, you were working for the church, and you went to appear on Dennis Prager's program. Now, what was the result of your study? What conclusions did you come to? What I came to was that... Uh, the uh, taking of human life is a real tragedy that uh, um, to make the choice of a woman um, overwhelm the life of, of a baby. Mm -hmm. That we as Adventists, we believe in uh, creation life yes. uh, and the preserving of that and to see abortion as the taking of that. It seems like we're making ourselves the lords of life and death. Okay. We have no business doing that. So in other words, your, your first encounter was the study in 1980, and your conclusion was basically that it's wrong. It's, mor yes. it's morally, it's morally uh, inconsistent with both the Bible and, our, and uh, what should be our position as a church, or mission as a church. Yes. Now initially, the um, exclusion or allowance for uh, situations of rape mm -hmm. and um, incest, uh, were they, they, I, I was on board with making allowance for that okay. for years. Uh -huh. uh, but since then I have, in the last number of years, uh, come to terms with that as well. Could you tell us a little bit, little bit about the story of how did you learn about abortion inside our church what were you doing at that time, and how easy was it for you to learn about this information? So I began to have convictions on this, and uh, um, I was a script writer for the Yiddish Written Telecast. Okay. Um, we were always looking for issues of consequence to talk about, and uh, one day, Speaker Director George Vanman presented me with a script somebody else had written. Normally, I, I would write half the scripts, and a friend of mine would write. I did prophecy and doctrine, okay. and my friend did health and uh, family. Um, and so someone, not, uh, someone came, up with a, came up with a script that uh, promoted abortion uh, choice. Okay. And uh, I was tasked with fixing it up a little bit. And so uh, this came to be a crisis. I told Elder Vanneman, I said, George, 
uh, I can't do this. I said, I believe that prenatal life is sacred and this thing cannot be fixed up uh, as, it, as it is. And so he said, well, um, if you're not willing to do this, we'll have to have somebody else fix it up. I said, well, I, I can't be part of a ministry that would be producing for our hundreds of thousands of viewers something that would um, endorse this. Okay. So he said, well, let's take this to the script committee. So on the script committee, we had a, a real discussion. I brought photographs of aborted fetuses. Okay. And of course, it's, 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 it's terrible to see. Yeah. And, and, but it is a scientific, re this is the result of abortion. Okay. This is That's what- the, This is the physical reality. This is what it does to a baby. Mm -hmm. And, and, Instead of being gaslit, oh, uh, you're bringing it, that's disgusting. What are you? No, no, no. This is what it is. And so let's talk about How did the this. committee respond to that? Uh, the committee, they, uh, they were my friends, okay. and, and they were sympathetic, but they felt that this script ought to be as, as it is. And so I said, well, if, if that's the case, and you decide to go ahead with this, I'm going to have to leave this ministry. Um, I don't, I've got two small children. I don't know what I'm gonna do here with this, but uh, so Elder Vanderman afterward took me out to lunch at a nice Mexican restaurant. Now, now Martin, he said, please, let's, let's think this through. Let's be, I said, George, I thought this through. I prayed about this and, and I said, I mean it. And uh, then an idea came to my mind. I said, uh, I write scripts for you. Why don't you let me fix this the way I think it should be according to scriptural principles? Let me work with it and give it back to you. You see what you think. So I rewrote it and took out all the um, pro-choice rhetoric. Yeah, I, I, that, I, I decaffeinated it, if you please, De okay. from all of that, and and so that it was. Um, it showed it. Uh, uh, it still expressed compassion for uh, the mothers of uh, mothers in crisis, which I think is we always have, that has to be a major consideration. I for decades have worked with uh, uh, pregnancy centers, collaborated with people in the community yeah. to, to stand up for, to support women in crisis. I think it's a horrible thing to take a stand without supporting a person. Uh, where's Good Time Charlie in all this? Yeah. Of course, many abortions, it's not that, but most, there's some guy that uh, hit his way, and now he's off without responsibility. Hey, let's find him. Let's have some accountability. Um, so you presented this topic to the script committee, and you had come to such a strong conviction that you told them, listen, uh, I'm not comfortable with this. I don't think that the Bible supports this. And I'm willing to leave my work, even though uh, economically I'm not in a position to leave. I'm dependent upon this job. I'm not going to stay here. I'm not going to be part of a work that publishes any type of material that is supportive of killing children. And if I need to, I'm going to leave this work before I go forward with this. So you had come to the point in your life where you were willing to make a serious sacrifice uh, for principle, for yeah, the biblical yeah. evidence that you were aware of. And, and how, did, how did It Is Written Ministry, how did they respond to that? Yeah, I should say that I believe everyone around that table also had principles of which they had con uh, convicted, convictions to the point where they would leave the ministry if you know, okay. and so I wasn't. I was any better than anybody else. It's just that my convictions were different on this particular point. On this point, yeah. that's right. And so, to my great joy and satisfaction, Elder Vanderman and the committee liked what I did, and so we went forward with that. It didn't say all that I uh, that could be said, yeah. but it 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 basically affirmed life and the support of women who are pregnant. And there was not the hint that it was okay, not the hint of, of terminating that being okay. It was a s support of women and support of life. So your first experience learning about abortion was with Prager in 1980, several years later. 
it is abortion inside the Adventist church. And you took a principled stand for that, mm -hmm. uh, and which was risky, but it turned out in your favor and it worked out. So mm -hmm. you, continued with, you continued working with this and other ministries. Now, I'd like to go forward a few more years. How did you become a member of the GC Executive Committee? Well, um, in my writing for Elder Vanderman, um, one of our books was selected as Book of the Year, uh, and I managed to get something on, on um, the sanctity of life in, in that book, what I like about uh, different denominations, it, yeah. trying to reach out, trying to connect on our common areas of interest. And we Adventists haven't always done that too well. We have so often come in and started a big argument uh, that many churches back in the 19th century were, were born that way. Someone comes into town, challenges the main preacher, has an argument, a debate, wins the debate, and starts a church. But this is a whole different thing. Elder Vanderman wanted me to come up with um, uh, a series uh, connecting, saying nice things about different churches. So I said, oh, uh, let's include the Catholics. And he said, what, what could we say that would be appropriate for that? I said, well, uh, give me a chance. I'm willing to burn the time at my own expense if and redo something else. And so this gave you the opportunity to talk about the sanctity of life. Oh, yes, yes. Because, of course, I could point out, you know, uh, in this, what I like about, you say nice things about the church, then you express some, you know, concerns or questions. Well, I am not a Catholic because, you know, they're my friends, but I'm not a So uh, this gave a wonderful opportunity to talk about our Catholic friends stand up for the sanctity of marriage and the sanctity of unborn life. And that got in that book. And that, that it, it was a series of eight telecast scripts, and it was a book. And for the telecast, Religion and Media, they gave us a Silver Angel Award for that. Okay. I mean, they filmed some in Germany, and, you know, it was like Luther, the Lutherans, Baptists, and, and such. And uh, so as a book, it was selected by the church as the book of the year, and uh, uh, and there was um, a quarter million copies, and then we made a proposal accepted by the press, 500,000 more, a total of 750,000 copies in English, and then they translated into Spanish, and down south of the border they put that Catholic chapter first. It was the first time, I think, that anything positive had been said. Yeah. of substance about Catholics, and, and they took it, they went with it down there in Spanish and Portuguese. The end result being, we were able to say some nice things about our Catholic friends, including the sanctity of life. Oh, praise God for that. And, and then, of course, uh, how did I get to the, uh, on the GC Executive Committee? I had also written a couple books that, um, one of which was uh, uh, a book of the year, sharing book of the year, and, and uh, written some articles and such. And so um, the Ministerial Association at the General Conference at that time was strongly pro-life. Our director, Floyd Brzee, um, David Newman, executive editor of Ministry Magazine, was kind of like the, the spark, the, he was the, the, the strength center of, uh, of that. And so uh, we saw an opportunity to uh, come up with a, uh, I should back up a bit. We had published, or I say we, I wasn't there yet, um, a couple articles about the uh, inconsistency of having two different statements. You've done videos on the. Uh, now, the to stop for our viewers, some may not be aware, a lot of them will be, the Adventist Church had two statements on abortion, 1970, the published version, and then a different version in 1971, of which most Adventists were unaware of. So in the 1980s, when you're making a reference to these two statements, you're referring, correct, to these 1970-71? Yes. Okay, continue, please. Yes. And um, um, unfortunately, and I would venture the word scandalously, um, we had a public statement that sounded, you know, good and proper and acceptable. Uh, and then uh, another statement that was a de facto. Uh, so along came... Um, 
Elder Falkenberg as the new president, um, a younger man, and he wanted to get, get that straightened out so that we were not using uh, um, dece deceptive you know, or contradicting statements. He wanted to, the church to speak with a clear upfront Above he, the board. he didn't want multiple voices on the same topic. He wanted just one single statement that just clarified the issue. Does that? If, if yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, yeah. Indeed. And so um, uh, we saw in that an opportunity. I say we by now. Uh, David Newman, who knew my pro-life statements, uh -huh. brought me on board his staff. Newman and Brzee wanted me to be on the General Conference Executive Committee, okay. as well as the President's Council, which was a kind of a steering committee for the executive to pre-discuss stuff that, uh, items that went on, went on there. So yeah, I found myself from, from it is written to, to uh, there, moved across the country. We flew there with 12 cats, by the way. Somebody, what, 12 cats? Cats, 12 cats, you wow. know. And hey, you're, yeah. You can't, 12 cats. Well, we gave one of them away. Well, if Jesus had 12 disciples, we can have 12 cats. Um, but anyway, uh, so there we were. And uh, uh, soon after we got there, in fact, immediately after, there was a Potomac Conference constituency meeting where my college friend George Gaynor, now a professor okay. or a chaplain, I think, and professor at CUC, um, had gotten this item on the agenda of a Potomac. Now, Potomac is a large conference, probably major north of Florida on the East Coast. It was a home conference for the General Conference headquarters. Uh -huh. So it was a significant thing for him to do that. And I was amazed at that meeting where George was able to challenge the, the system to, 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 um, take seriously abortion, specifically w with our hospital. There had to be accountability would be the word. And uh, George had an answer for any object. Every obje it was a glorious thing. I was just sitting there as a participant. I mean, as a, in the audience. I had no part with that. I just had my eyes open. And we all got very excited that the General Conference Executive Committee was uh, okay. We've got some momentum here. We can move forward at next year's annual council. Okay, so this all is happening around the time of the summer of 1991. Yes. That this issue, George Gaynor, uh, I believe, is simultaneously going forward with his research into this issue. Yes. And so in this is happening, this agitation of the abortion issue is happening in the summer of 1991 yes. at the Potomac Conference, and which was significant because just one year later, 14, 15 months later, in October of 1992, the Adventist Church, the Annual Council, votes on this current position. The current position of our church on abortion was voted on October of 1992. So this is one year before that takes place. Now, could you t tell us a little bit more background on any type of relevant events or stories that come to your mind leading up to the Annual Council? Sure. The General Conference Ministerial Association um, made a decision that we were going to advocate strongly for pro-life, uh, that we were going to um, basically do our job in being uh, in helping the pastors of the church and leading their churches uh, to uh, to to support life consistent with the first angel's message of Revelation 14, consistent with the commandment, uh, thou shalt not kill, consistent with the Sabbath commandment, which honors creation life, consistent with trust in Jesus Christ, who gives us life as our creator in the beginning and new life through salvation. So we strategized, we had a, a real, and, and the, the capstone of our strategy was to have the month before the uh, October session, have se the September issue of ministry devoted to uh, the abortion issue, mm -hmm. pro-life, yes. 
So, so at this time, are you working directly with Newman in Ministry Magazine, or you're just helping with content? Or oh yes, I was I was one of the two associate editors. So by this time, you're one of the yes. By this time, I was on board at the GC as an editor, as a member of the President's Council and the Executive Committee. So we thought we had, uh, and I give great uh, great credit to um, uh, Floyd Brzee. And, and David Newman, they were the spark plug in. So we were all, and we were advocating, we were lobbying. We, we were, um, we invited general conference vice presidents to our homes to, you know, to talk about this Sabbath afternoon over lo after lunch. Mm -hmm. So we were unabashedly advocating for this and we thought we had some momentum. So I, I wanna stop and just highlight that, that prior to the vote by the executive committee in October 1992, there were several, if there were quite a few, members of the General Conference who were very strongly pro-life and who were making uh, assertive or, I don't know if the word aggressive would be uh, okay, but they, they were making efforts to try to influence and share pro-life views with other committee members or leaders in the church. In a collegial way. In, in a family way. Yeah, and uh, the, the members of the ministerial association, it turned out to be, we were, at the end of the day, basically the only ones that voted for it. Okay. But we, we tried to get health and temperance, tried to get religious liberty, and uh, would you be interested in what the arguments for and con with that? Me to sum summarize. Sure, summarize. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll summarize. Okay, for uh, religious liberty, it was my understanding that they thought that um, a pro-life initiative might uh, counter the religious liberty work and ultimately result in a the Sunday law initiative. Okay. Now, I hope I'm being fair. With them, but that was, that was your understanding. That was my understanding of them and generally those Adventists who might be categorized or categorize themselves as liberals. It was, you know, concern over if this law, the moral majority from Jerry Falwell, you know, that was the big fear of that time. Sure. And, and yeah, so. so that's religious liberty. How did other okay. departments? Okay, so now, now, uh, what about the conservatives? Okay, we thought, okay, that, that's where we're going to, uh, you know, life, you know. Now, uh, we found that the argument, the reason why a lot of conservative leaders would not take a stand, would not join us, because like I say, ultimately we were left as a ministerial association all alone. Uh -huh. uh, the reason given was that Ellen White never specifically spoke against the intentional termination of unborn human life. Now, as you have said in your videos, as we hear abundantly from others, she does speak and acknowledge that the unborn uh, is a living child, mm -hmm. and we should protect and enhance that life. She rebukes selfish husbands for uh, expecting the wife to, you know, during the pregnancy, to take care of your wives, you know, be, 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 be good to them, and yeah. But, number one, she's never used the word abortion. Now, if you go to on the White Estate website and click Avenus Pioneer Library, 17 times you'll find church leaders talking against abortion. Seven, that's just in that particular library because uh, the abortion issue was a live issue through the mid later 19th yes, century. Yes. And uh, a number of our leading doctors and theologians spoke out against it, including James White. Mm -hmm. But Ellen White never spoke the word abortion, and although she certainly did not advocate the taking of life, she never specifically, this is what we heard from the church leaders who would not get on board with us, she never specifically spoke against the intentional termination of human life. I'm not sharing my assessment sure. necessarily. This is what we were hearing from people that, that would not get on board with us. This is why they did not. If Ellen White had whispered the word abortion, they would have flocked. 
uh, I, I found myself, you know, year after year, marching basically alone in the, the March for Life par parade in downtown Was Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. There would have been a whole, you know, leadership of Ellen Whitehead specifically taking a stand um, on this matter. No, that's a cool piece of trivia. So you are a member of the General Conference Ministerial Association, but you were actually marching in a March for Life program in Washington, D.C. I think that's really cool. I, I haven't heard that before. Um, but so, so if we understand you correctly, church leaders openly acknowledge that Ellen White uh, displayed deep concern for the welfare, both physically, morally, mentally, of the unborn child. She defined the unborn as living human children, and she said it was important to provide positive prenatal care. Now, I don't think anyone would attempt to say that abortion could in any way, shape, form, or degree be considered positive prenatal care. Right. In by, by definition, it's the opposite. But for the simple fact that Ellen White did not specifically or explicitly say that intentionally killing a child is wrong, therefore they did not want to join this effort to prohibit abortion from the Adventist perspective. Is that a fair summary? Yes, that's what we were hearing from the conservatives. Now, as we know, Ellen White was not shy about taking a stand about lots of things, tea, coffee, meat, um, Lots of, lots of things she, she talked about very explicitly. And so, um, but on this, she did not explicitly state uh, uh, the uh, speak against the intentional termination of unborn human life. Okay. Let's move forward a little bit. In, in your opinion, going down, to the, going down to September, October of the annual council when this vote is taking place, this is not only GC members, it's not only people from the NAD, this is going to involve members from uh, all over the world, Latin America, Asia, Africa, uh, and any these developing areas of the world especially. Now, in your opinion, were the church leaders from around the world, who the delegates who came to vote at this uh, annual council, in your opinion, do, these, do you believe that they were well informed of the significance, history, and nature of abortion in our church and the 1992 guidelines? Well, they certainly had the opportunity. They all got their issue of Ministry Magazine if they hadn't, you know. And also the, the, uh, uh, there was the debate going back and forth. Our theologians were, you know, expressing themselves. But uh, there are parts of the world where uh, they will follow leaders no matter what the leaders are doing. The um, thinking is, well, if this is God's man, as in male, to be chosen, then let's rally behind and this is God speaking through our Moses. And so they, that's where they would make their decision. And I confess huge disappointment. I thought that uh, I mean, travel around the world and, 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 and live in the homes of people and, and, and seem to be able to, to uh, um, have a dialogue. But at the end of the day, wherever the leader said, follow me, or let's do this, that's where they typically went. And, and, and they did that day because like, we, we only, we lost, um, we, we got less than 10% of the vote. So, Ministry Magazine, Newman reports that over 90% of those who voted, voted in favor of the document. And Liberty Magazine, an article in January, February 1993, which was authored by you, uh, states that only five people opposed or dissented from the vote. Now, that's, that's quite significant, over 90%. I'd like to read a quote and ask for your feedback. It says, Although foreign delegates could have coalesced to defeat the statement when it was before the annual council, they instead supported it because it was normal within the Adventist system to ratify a report from a committee and because they saw it as responding to an American need and therefore of little relevance to them. I, I, I think that's, that's largely true. Let, let, may we talk a little bit about 
the committee. There was a Christian, human life, a human life committee. Yes, Christian view of human life committee. Yes, and David Newman was was part of that. Well, which was largely um, made up of Americans, and those who were not Americans uh, were foreign-born, had been raised in America, or something of that degree. Yeah, and um, initially uh, it, it was written by someone with a pro-choice mm -hmm. perspective, well, trying to navigate, yes, we believe in the Creator, yes, we believe in creative life, but... Uh, you know, life of the mother, health of the mother. Uh, now, of course, health of the mother. Y y you can drive a freight train through that, y y you know. Basically, uh, the statement wound up as, in our opinion, at the Ministerial Association, pro-life foliage, but uh, pro-choice pro substance. Now when you use that phrase to drive a freight train through, what you're trying to illustrate is that the phrase, a mother's health, because it is not defined explicitly, can be used uh, to such a large extent as to negate any type of pro-life statement or position. In other words, mother's health serves as the same legal loophole that was used also in Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton to justify abortion on demand. And if we hear you correctly, what you're saying is that there were some members on the committee who understood that and raised that concern. Yeah, yes. Now, uh, David was one of them, John Emily uh, Youngberg and uh, Teresa Beam, other, others on, on that committee. But the committee uh, endorsed a document that was definitely a, 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 kind of like a biblical support of what was going, what had happened with Roe Ro v. Wade. And, and Newman was, David was concerned that there were hardly if any scriptural texts, scriptures in the, in the initial document. And so they said, well, come up with some. And so they were kind of more or less tacked on to the end. If you notice, it's, it, Scripture is not interwoven throughout. Yeah, yes, uh, jo uh, the Youngbergs point that out in an article how October 9, 1992, the committee voted on a position on euthanasia. Now, the euthanasia position is followed by sentence, sentence, Scripture, Scripture, yes. sentence, sentence, Scripture, yes. Scripture. Whereas our position on abortion is one long statement with, quote, biblical principles attached on to the end, seemingly disconnected and surely not explanatory of the actual statement itself. And that's the story behind it. David Newman objected and got scriptures. Uh, that was the best he could do with it. And um, so... Um, uh, and, and so that statement was 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 set in concrete as this is what's going to be voted on. Then the the, the next strategy was to uh, have an alternative, a a minority statement, a pro life document, a minority statement to choose between. So it wouldn't be up and down on this humanistic, religious but humanistic. Uh, non-inherently, intrinsically biblical statement okay. and give them a biblical alternative, mm -hmm. pro-life. And so that, that discussion, that battle went on, but that battle we won. And so, although I was not a member of the pre-sub, the, the pre-committee, Human Life Committee, that was long enforced before I got there, I was a member of the Executive Committee uh, and so um, I was asked uh, to actually take their thoughts, me being a writer, write up, and and I actually wrote this 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 uh, minority document, pro life, that the world delegates could vote upon, up or down, and and that document got defeated, more than nine to one, and in the last. Uh, 29, what, what's it been, uh, 28 years, it has lived on a succession of, of laptops that I've had, you know, that it just dead and ignored as if it never existed. And so, um, yeah, that, that's, what got, that's what got voted down. 
Now, there's an interesting statement in December 1992 Ministry Magazine. It says, For the first time, instead of debating all of the items on the floor, the annual council created five discussion groups that were separate from each other and delegates could go to whichever one was interesting to them. Do you think that this may have had some influence or effect on people's awareness of the abortion issue instead of debating it all together in one group, having it in this, these separate groups, do, do, do you think that in any way shaped uh, the way people voted or understood the issue? This, this is just my perception. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was an attempt to diffuse examination and discussion uh, so that essentially only one-fifth, since there were, I think, five different, uh, uh, everybody would be in different places and those who might be persuaded by discussion would not be enough to sway the whole group. That, that's, that, that was my perception. Now, Liberty Magazine records, you said five voted against. Now, you were obviously one of those five. Mm -hmm. um, another one was possibly Newman. Yes. Now, are you, do you know the identity of the other three? Um, Is that a curiosity? Uh, my, my, my guess would be the others on the committee would, would have been uh, Obviously, Floyd, Floyd Brzee, the head of the department, mm -hmm. and um, my possibly my co-associate editor, John Fowler, would have. I know he was pro-life. I think he was on that committee, and uh, but George Gaynor was not a part of that committee. Nor were the Young Birds of the Beams. They were part of the pre-preparation committee, but not the executive committee. So those of us who were on that committee. Of, uh, they were back in, in the audience kind of cheering us on during the debate. Most people could not comment, but those of us who were able to were quite busy. My, my wife was in the audience. She remembers me holding up a magazine during the discussion of whether or not to, uh, which of these two documents to work for, uh, holding up uh, one of our magazines that talked about uh, it is wrong for a pregnant woman to drink coffee because it affects the fetal heart beat for a few minutes. Okay, here it is right here, yeah. So if it is wrong to make, to affect the heat fetal heartbeat for a few minutes, to do that to the fetal heart, researchers have shown that as little as two cups of coffee can decrease placental blood flow by 25%. So it and, affects and, the heart. And why, uh, explain why you read that at, at the executive committee. Uh, yeah, uh, 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 picture there's several hundred people there they're, they're holding up the magazine to show the, the, the logic gap between being so concerned about the blood flow and heartbeat, you know, mm -hmm. but here we're going to take that heart, and I said, abortion takes a heart and tears it apart. If we're concerned about, the, you know, the blood flow and... Uh, how much more concerned should we be about ripping that heart apart? Yes. And, and yeah, my wife remembers that. And another time, uh, I remember getting up, there was a euphemism called the termination, the, the interruption of, of pregnancy. Yes, that state. was the title of the 1971 guidelines. Yeah. And, and uh, church leaders uh, of that time and some of some of them I were were still were still around right. defending this interruption of pregnancy. Yeah. So I went up to the mic and I said, "Please," and the person who coined that phrase was there. Please, could you help us understand if abortion just interrupts a pregnancy? How do we get it started again? And was there any attempt to provide an answer to that? It was stone cold silence. Just silence. Yeah. No one responded. No. What was your internal response when you saw that we voted this in? I mean, how, I mean, what was going through your mind? Uh, uh, I, I, I felt crushed, and I think we all at the ministerial series, we thought we had done our job. We thought we had made our case. A ministry magazine that they all had, we thought, had some pretty persuasive arguments. Mm -hmm. And our statements on the floor were not specifically rebutted by information. It was more, uh, more along the lines of political considerations, cultural considerations. In fact, if I remember correctly, in the January 1993 
Minist uh, Liberty Magazine, there's a statement where someone at the committee stated that we should not only, number one, retain the 1971 interruption of pregnancy guidelines, but that number two, we shouldn't vote on this right now because of the presidential, uh, the upcoming presidential election. In other words, because of po politics outside of the Adventist church and politics only in the USA, the World Church Committee, this GC committee, should not vote on such an important moral issue. Is that, is that a correct? Uh, yeah. Now, the very uh, important leader or recently retired leader who, who had made that proposal, on that particular issue, there was instant blowback from the people on the other, uh, from the other countries. And I wish the the resistance to American imperialism, like we're not going to uh, delay our business because of an American holiday. I wish that fervor could have transferred over to life. But uh, so in that instance, they, they didn't follow leadership, but when it came down to life, they did. Let's move forward. I'd like to ask you a question. How do you believe the church's support or justification or excuses for abortion, how do you think this affects our mission as a church? Well, I found out firsthand at Logos Bible Software after my retirement. I was invited to go to Logos and create a Seventh-day Adventist product line. Logos is the uh, Faith Life Logos the largest purveyor of Christian digitized content in the world, and we developed five Seventh-day Adventist master libraries uh, from our theologians around the world. And so uh, I had opportunity at the time, there were 400 employees, to uh, uh, a lot of them seminary trained or seminary professors, and just to have a theological feast every single day, yeah. interacting with people going, you know, it's, uh, uh, meeting or uh, coffee shop and just, you know, talking back and forth. And, and when I was asked, what's the difference between what you have in us believe and what we believe as evangelicals or, or Catholics, I said, well, uh, the difference can be best between we have in us and our doctrine and what you believe can best be explained in the context of your own Christian faith. What? And if I knew them well, I poked them in the chest and say, in other words, we have in us are more consistent in our doctrine with your Christian faith than you are. And then, you know, we friends, we can yeah, just like that. that. So, of course, I had to put up or shut up. So I said, okay, so rest. You believe in resting in Christ, right? Okay, well, hey, the Sabbath is God's gift of cessation, rest in Christ for, to celebrate life and new life, okay? Now, community, you believe in that. Uh, so, our doctrine of death is that we don't, we, we go to heaven in community, not floating off as distant. You believe in justice, right? Okay, how just is it to torment someone in eternity? You know, so, and, and you believe in taking care of your body, you're in shape. And yeah, as, as, so we have in this, we're holistic in, intrinsically in our, in our fundamental beliefs. So, I found there at Logos with these hundreds of people, that uh, there was widespread understanding and a, a welcoming to, into a, cr a Christian community of, 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 of our fundamental beliefs. They just said, but why don't you folks support uh, pro-life? And they also couldn't understand why, if we could defend everything from the Bible, why do we depend so much upon Ellen White? Those yeah. two, those two issues. But it was amazing uh, how what support there was for what we believe as fundamental Christian thought. So, uh, so you're working at Logo Software. You're working with in um, Northwest Washington State, and you're working with Catholics, Evangelicals people of all types of faith persuasions and denominations, and these are not just average lay people. You're dealing with PhDs and seminarians and professors, very intelligent people who can articulate their faith. They're working together with Logos to develop software so that people can understand all this different theological mat and material. So you're going to work every day surrounded by very intelligent, perceptive thinkers 
and they greatly appreciate many of the truths that the Adventist Church shares with the world, and, and, and they greatly admire what you're doing. But there are, there's one point in particular that they're confused about or disagree about uh, or that they see as a glaring inconsistency in our witness, and that is, if I understand you, is abortion. Yes, without question. I, and I just had to be honest and say, I'm, I'm sorry, this is, this is an anomaly. Uh, I, I fought hard for life, and so, um, yeah, I, yeah. So in, in, a much, in a much larger sense, I mean, to go forward into the future, when God does bless us and we want to go forward sharing this message and making Christ magnificent to the entire world, that cannot happen if, if or while we are showing support for the breaking of the Sixth Commandment. Would you agree with that? Oh, oh yes, and, and it's not just for our evangelism or our perception. It's, our, I believe, our integrity before God. I believe that the parable of Jesus, we, tares among the wheat, uh, is terribly manifested here. I think that here we've got tares among the, a, a, a huge tear among the wheat. Uh, of, with, 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 with this. And I personally believe the final remnant, we are those who keep the commandments of God, not yeah. just the uh, uh, talk about it. I, I, I think it's a deal killer. I will just say right now, if, if we think we as Adventists are once saved, always saved, as a favored group of God, simply because we've been entrusted with such truths, mm -hmm. let's think again of the Jewish nation. They had all the truths. They even had Messiah come born from their ranks. And what happened? Paul said, the kingdom of God is taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruit thereof. Let us beware, lest we think ourselves corporately once saved, always saved, uh, and uh, no matter what we do about issues such as abortion, and specifically abortion. His hands were nailed to the cross. Jego ręce zostały przybite do krzyża. Because of all the bad things we've done with our hands. Ze względu na wszystkie złe rzeczy, które my swoimi rękami do, uczyniliśmy. His feet were nailed to the cross. Jego stopy zostały przybite do krzyża. Because of all the bad places we've gone with our feet. Ze względu na te wszystkie złe miejsca, na które udaliśmy się naszymi nogami. He wore a rough, painful crown of thorns. On miał włożoną na głowę tak bolesną, straszliwą koronę cierniową. Because of all the bad thoughts we've had in our minds. Ze względu na wszystkie złe myśli, które nam przyszły do głowy. Jesus, hanging on the cross, bore the curse of my sin and your sin. Jezus wiszący na krzyżu poniósł przekleństwo Twojego i mojego grzechu. He went to hell. Many people learn about this issue of abortion in their church, and they go through, I'd like to say, they go through two shocks. Shock number one is to learn that abortion is inside the Adventist church. Mm -hmm. And shock number two is to, when you share about this information or ask for clarification, many times you are met with indifference or apathy. And this can be, for many people, very uh, extremely discouraging. In fact, there have been a few people over the years who have actually left the church because of this issue. Now, you, even though you took such a strong stand in the 1980s, that it is written, you still remain a member of this church, and even though now you are retired, you still are very active in this church, and you appear to love and support this church very much. How are you able to maintain this faith, even though you know that our church's official moral position is openly, publicly supportive of abortion? A very important question. I think of what Peter said um, when Jesus, in John chapter 6, uh, when so many disciples were abandoning him, Jesus turned to the twelve and said, Will you also go away? And, G and Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So what else is out there for us to belong to? These 28, 20, 28 fundamental beliefs are, are scriptural. Uh, so, uh, as long as, as they will put up with me, I'll put up with, you know, my fellow people around the world. I will, to use Ellen White's own words, agitate, 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 as you do. Uh, but uh, I am unabashedly uh, advocating 
for, for life. Now, I, I should give you a little follow-up to what happened to us at, at the Ministerial Association. Sure, please do. Okay, so after the 1992 vote, um, uh, I wrote a book with two chapters on abortion uh, where I defended life. And I gave it to the General Conference President, Elder Falkenberg, to read, and he approved it. I don't believe Elder Falkenberg was ever against life. He was against the confusion of having these two dueling statements that let the church vote. And so he certainly did not. He could have snuffed my book, but he let it go through to Pacific Press and it was published, Wrestling with Reality. It's been recently republished by, uh, dig digitally by, by the Pacific Press. I would love to see the present General Conference Ministerial Association to pick up this cause and move forward with it because there are those at headquarters who are fervently pro-life. And so there are those who are willing to support Another look at this. Let's take a look now with uh, time has passed. Shall we revisit this? I urge and plead for our church to take another look at this from a specifically biblical perspective. And so we can um, not only promote the commandments of God, but actually keep them. Well, Pastor Martin Weber, thank you very much for joining me here today. Thank you for sharing all of these thoughts. Uh, do you have any closing words that you'd like to share before we end? I am um, I'm grateful for in such a time as this to know the truth as it is in Jesus, to uh, stand up and speak out f for life. I, I, although I don't work for the church, I am a licensed um, a credential. I'm a credential minister. I have uh, uh, retirement credentials, and I'm grateful to be a Seventh-day Adventist, and I pray that we can rally around the cause of life. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. Open your mouth for the speechless in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth. Judge righteously and plead the cause of the poor and needy. My friends, thank you very much. This interview was made possible exclusively by you, subscribers to my videos. You bought me my plane ticket. You picked me up at the airport. You also dropped me off at the airport. You let me stay in your homes. You fed me really well. You made this happen. Thank you very much. This video is a huge contribution to the topic of abortion inside the Seventh-day Adventist Church because it provides much needed transparency and confirmation of events that took place in the 1980s and 1990s. One additional note, the It Is Written ministry, which began with Pastor George Vanderman, with whom Pastor Martin Weber worked, is now led by Speaker Director Pastor John Bradshaw, who has made very strong statements against abortion and in favor of life. So again, I want to thank everyone who helped make this interview happen. Thank you very much. This was a really cool experience and I definitely learned a lot. My friends, will you please join me in prayer that God will use this interview and other resources to help our church lift up Jesus by taking a biblical stand for the sanctity of human life. Thank you very much.